So we've had two cases so far for newly diagnosed uh, treatment and also uh, maintenance therapy post-transplant. Uh, here we're going to move to aggressive relapse of myeloma. So we'll start with a case of a 54-year-old African-American woman. Uh, in May of 2014, she presented with fatigue and back pain. Uh, her only past medical history is hypertension and mild renal impairment, hypertension being managed on Losartan. Her labs are significant for mild anemia, 11.4 hemoglobin, um, with a calcium slightly on the upper limit of normal, 11.1, uh, with a normal albumin of 3.6, creatinine slightly elevated at 1.5. She has a monoclonal protein at 0.8 grams per deciliter, an elevated beta-2 microglobulin at 5.2 milligrams per liter, and her LDH is 122. Her MRI did confirm multiple lytic lesions in her uh, vertebrae, and her marrow confirmed the diagnosis of myeloma, and she was found to have revised ISS stage 2 uh, with the translocation 1114. She was treated with RVD for six months and achieved a PR, and following systemic therapy, she went, underwent uh, autologous stem cell transplant. Uh, after discussion of risk and benefits, patient declined maintenance therapy, and so now about two and a half years later, uh, we find that she has now relapsed with an M spike of 0.6 grams per deciliter. Um, subsequently, uh, in June of 2017, approximately six months later, uh, we now have an M spike of 1.7, so relatively rapid doubling. Uh, and she was started on Dara, uh, daratumumab, lenalidomide, and dexamethasone, and she achieves a very good partial response. Unfortunately, in July of 2018, her MRI shows new lytic lesions, with it, uh, and although she has good performance status. Uh, and at this time, her labs show 11.5 hemoglobin, uh, calcium 9.8, with a good renal function of 1.1, M-spike 1.1, beta-2 microglobulin is 5.6. She did undergo a repeat bone marrow biopsy that identified deletion 17P, which was not detected initially, in 50% 50, in 50 of cells, in addition to the previously identified translocation 1114. So this patient with relapse disease um, brings up a very difficult area of myeloma management, which is how do you practice evidence-based therapy when there are so many regimens, all of which were published in high-impact journals? And I think one way to start is really to think about the backbone regimen on which these studies were done. So we can broadly divide them into lenalidomide backbone-containing regimens versus proteasome inhibitor. And so we have four uh, excellent phase three studies, all published in high-impact journals, comparing RD with the addition of a novel therapy. We have the Pollock study, uh, where daratumumab was added, uh, Eloquent study, where elotuzumab was added, Car Aspire, uh, where carfilzomib was added, and Tourmaline, where ixazomib was added. All with large numbers of patients, ranging from 570 to 800 patients. And the next uh, rows on the, on the table really highlight what we are told in medical school, we should not compare studies uh, directly to each other because the patient populations are different. And ex you know, distilled here are some salient features of the rates of ISS3, which can be as low as 12 to 21 percent. Fish, high-risk fish, can be as low as 13 to 30 percent. One or two lines of therapy. Importantly, um, refractoriness to uh, backbone regimens can really be important in these different regimens. And so in the PI-containing regimens, uh, carfilzomib and ixazomib, of course, we're not going to have as uh, much refractory to PI, uh, and some of those are probably protocol exceptions, whereas you had about 20 percent of patients in DARA and elotuzumab that were, uh, len were PI refractory. When you look at image refractoriness, again, by definition, none of these patients could have had LEN refractoriness, otherwise they would not have been uh, appropriate to randomize them to receive LEN-DEX. And so primarily we're looking at probably thalidomide refractoriness and ranging from 4 to 23 percent. Also important is what was their last line of therapy and were they refractory, 16 to 35 percent. So with all of that variability, it's really hard to say that there is going to be one right uh, regimen just by looking at um, the efficacy endpoints, which are summarized in the bottom of the table. First of all, these studies have ranging, uh, me the median follow-ups range from as short as uh, 23 months to as long as 67 months, and so that's going to affect the ability to detect whether or not a median uh, OS particularly has been reached. Um, then when we look at the response rates, the triplet arms can range from 78 to 93 percent, and the control arms range from 66 to 76 percent. And when we start looking at the survival-based endpoint, which is the primary endpoint for most of these studies, the PFS and the control arm, which hopefully, if since it's the same regimen, should be pretty comparable. We can see it's as low as 14.7 months for ixazomib, 
to as high as 17.5. And while that difference may seem subtle, when we look at the relative value added of the novel therapy, a difference of three months could really make a, quite a difference in the, the value added of a novel agent. But one way to consider this value added is the hazard ratio, which I think we have not historically had to do in myeloma because really there wasn't that many uh, there weren't that many choices to pick from. But when we look at the hazard ratios, which kind of gives you what is the relative value added, it ranges from as high as 0.74 to as low as 0.44. And so really, the, the, one of the standouts here is the dara Lendex with a, the lowest hazard ratio of 0.44, meaning uh, almost a 60% uh, improvement in PFS with the addition of daratumumab. And when we go to the OS, of course, again, because the median follow-ups are different, we're going to not reach median OS for some of these arms, but the two that have longer follow-ups, I think, have an important uh, implication. Both showed that the OS was improved, whether it was the addition of elotuzumab or carfilzomib, with hazard ratio 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.78, 0 0.79. Why is that important? I think it tells us that if you, in the relapse setting, if you treat with more aggressive regimens, eventually that could translate into an OS benefit. With the caveat, of course, as I alluded to earlier, we have to be mindful of access to therapy. A lot of these phase three studies are done ex-US and might not show an OS benefit in the US. But be that as it may, with all the caveats of phase three studies, I think these are very important results. And it gives us a lot of options as well for patients. So uh, using evidence-based medicine, this patient did get uh, daratumumab with uh, lenalidomide and DEX um, because she was len naive. The problem, though, is as we discussed in the last case, most U.S. patients are getting lenalidomide maintenance, which basically eliminates the entire table that we just looked at, because if you were refractory to len maintenance, you would not have been eligible for any of those studies. So it's good to have options for PI backbone-containing regimens. And so here we're looking at VD-containing regimens. Uh, these are all phase three studies, again, except for one, the uh, elotuzumab. So we have VD as a control arm, in Castra, the addition of daratumumab, uh, Endeavor, carfilzomib at 56 milligrams per meter squared, Panabinistat, the addition of uh, Panabinistat to VD, um, Elotuzumab, uh, and uh, the Eloquent study, um, and finally recently presented um, the Optimism study, PVD versus VD. So uh, we can see the, the sample size ranges from um, 152, which is the phase two study, to the other ones, which are higher phase three. Um, again, variability in ISS stage, variability in ISS. Uh, lines of therapy. Here we see that the refractoriness to PI goes down significantly because of the control arm being VD. Refractoriness to IMID, however, ranges um, in the, the DARA, particularly 33%, um, and some of those were LEN refractory because this was uh, also open in the U.S. Um, to uh, not reported. Um, and refractory to last nine therapy also varies. When we go to the efficacy endpoints, again, the median follow-up ranges from as short as 15.9 uh, months uh, to as long as 37.5. And the response rates uh, in the control arm is typically around 60, 50 to 60 percent. And, um, and the, the triplet therapies are, uh, or the KD at a high dose uh, of 56 milligrams per meter squared have result in a response rate ranging from 55 to 82 percent or 85 percent. But the uh, primary endpoint again here was PFS, and we see that the control arms PFS range from as short as 6.9 months to as long as 9.4 months. I think this is important because one of the unique uh, features of the DARA study is that the VD was stopped uh, after eight cycles. And so a lot of people criticize that because then obviously you're going to stack the odds in favor of the triplet regimen. But when you look at the numbers, Remember that these studies were often giving VD intravenously twice weekly, and what we're seeing is it's hard to give VD for too long, either because of efficacy or tolerability. The range is from seven to nine months. So it's not that the DARA VD control arm is such an outlier compared to the other arms. But when we look at the value added, again, very striking hazard ratio benefit with the addition of daratumumab down to 0.32. Uh, again, all of the other ones uh, also showing favorable uh, benefit, ranging from 0.53 to 0.72. Again, using, I think, hazard ratios more justified, we can see, for example, um, that the PVD-VD control arm, that some of those patients, we had a median of two lines of therapy, so uh, they, some of these more heavily treated patients, we might not re expect as much of a benefit, but the hazard ratio telling us the value added. And again, um, when we look at the, uh, the OS, uh, we did see the KDVD, the Endeavor study, has been recently reported to translate into an OS benefit. Uh, the PANO study was very, um, did not show that benefit, uh, but not extensively used in the U.S. Uh, currently. But I think, again, uh, another example that treating uh, aggressively in the relapse 
uh, can the PFS benefits can translate into OS, but again, remembering the importance of drug access um, and the primary versus secondary endpoints.